All right. Uh, this one's going to be focused on uh, Chinese politics and economics and culture. Really, in about the same time that we have talked about Europe up to this point already. Uh, with China, we're going to go a little bit further into the 1700s, into about the end of the 1700s, uh, and discuss some of their uh, major kind of demographic and slight cultural changes and challenges to uh, government control. Uh, in order to understand the rise of what historians might call early modern China, um, it's important to go all the way back to about the mid-1300s when China was, had been conquered and was basically ruled by a foreign occupation. A foreign group from Mongolia had come in and conquered all of China and uh, set up their own type of occupation government. Uh, China is in the mainland of Eastern Asia, probably the largest and one of the most profitable places to run. So it was often a target of foreign invasion going way back into ancient history. Um, they had a, river, a couple of river systems that created hugely fertile land that you could grow a lot of food on. So there's a lot of trade in the area. There's a, a large food supplier, a large population even back then. Um, so China had historically been uh, a target for foreign invasion. Uh, we're to the point where they build uh, massive defense systems, the uh, Great Wall of China in uh, years before year zero. Uh, so that's a long story going far back into Chinese history. But as we kind of enter in early modern China, about the 1300s, uh, that foreign occupation is overthrown. So this is where China is on the world map, way over here on the eastern coast of Asia, um, kind of bordering this little outlet of the peninsula that is generally known as Southeast Asia. And India is here known as kind of South Asian kind of subcontinent. Uh, China back then was not as large today, or as large then as territorially as it is today. Uh, China in the 1950s invaded uh, Tibet and conquered many more Western lands than uh, China had usually occupied going far back into its past. Uh, the last Mongol ruler was Kublai Khan. And uh, this is the general area that he had control over. So you see far, uh, going, this is kind of mainland uh, Chinese civilization between the two river systems. And Mongolia is up here kind of to the northwest. So the Khans had ruled over both for quite a while by that point. And in the mid-1300s and the 1360s, basically a peasant revolt breaks out against a foreign occupation and is eventually successful. And it's fairly quickly successful given the amount of time that the Khans had ruled. So this is largely an uprising of the Chinese people to kick out the foreign conquerors. The leader of the uprising, Zhu, went in and created the next Chinese dynasty. Uh, Chinese history is largely a history of dynasties, long-term royal families, much like in Europe where you get this one family who uh, are the kings down through the generations. So you get a series of uh, Chinese dynasties going way, way back into Chinese history, into ancient times. So a lot of uh, history textbooks and documentaries and whatnot will discuss certain dynasties and their differences and certain policies and whatnot. But these dynasties usually last quite a long time. There's only a few dynasties that are only lasted you know, a decade or two. Most of them stay in power for quite a while. So Zhu sets up the next dynasty in 1369. They call it the Ming Dynasty, which translates to the Bright Dynasty, the kind of uh, bright new era of domestic Chinese rule. And they keep control over the country for uh, a little under 300 years. So the next major uprising that gets rid of the Ming uh, will not occur until the mid-1600s. But the Ming do a lot of important things in China. Uh, these are the areas that the Ming control. Uh, number one, they launch uh, 
foreign invasions a little bit into the west of the kind of ancestral Chinese civilization area, their territory. So they go a little bit west and conquer some new areas. They also start launching invasions against Southeast Asia, that peninsula to their south. Uh, those are fairly successful over time. They even start launching explorations as early as the very early 1400s. Chinese ships are known to have gone into the Indian Ocean and explored around South Asia, explored the coastline and into the ocean. Uh, they had advanced um, uh, navigational tools, like a magnetic compass that the Europeans didn't have yet. And uh, largely the Europeans don't get it until they adapt it from the Ottomans, who had adapted it from the Chinese in the first place. So the Chinese had had these kinds of instruments for a couple centuries by now, by the 1400s. So uh, they start exploring, and they pull back. The Ming government stops it for reasons that historians still don't know today. We don't know exactly why they stopped those explorations. There's a lot of different arguments. One of the more popular arguments amongst historians is that the Chinese leaders viewed their culture as superior to anything they were coming in contact with. So what's the value of exploring other places? They already had uh, largely enough food. Um, they had what they thought were the heights of human achievement in their own area. So, you know, the, for in a lot of their ideas were uh, the best thing we can do to keep this great culture is to not explore other places and invite foreigners in, but to actively keep them out as much as possible. So it's a kind of a cultural-centric type of view that, uh, you know, a lot of different cultures have come up with throughout the years. Um, the Portuguese are known to have been the first to make contact with China. Uh, Marco Polo went off on a very famous expedition and he argued that he made contact with China and then went back to Portugal uh, as early as the mid-1300s. So there are very early initial contacts, but those contacts are not supported or expanded by, say, the Portuguese government or any European government. And to keep those contacts up consistently with the technology they had back then would have had to have been basically a government program. It was that expensive. So the European governments decide for one reason or another not to. Uh, the contacts are not kept up and it's just kind of bits and pieces over hundreds of years until again the Portuguese start exploring around Africa trying to get to India in the mid to late 1400s. So the Portuguese ships uh, in the early 1500s start going beyond India and even into China, eventually uh, mostly arriving in the southern areas of China and realizing that there's a lot of things they could buy there to make money and send it back to Europe. So the mercantilist theory starts taking hold and the Portuguese are really the first to enter China in a large way in the 1500s and start making uh, economic demands, which of course the Ming will try to resist. Uh, the Ming will give the Portuguese uh, entrance into only one port way far in the south coast of China, you know, really away from the major population centers up here in the north. Basically, the idea is they want to take advantage of the European trade so that they can make money, uh, maybe gain access to European technology, uh, but also keep them as far away from the population of China as possible to limit the cultural contacts and basically keep the, the foreigners at an arm's length. Um, the Ming's are powerful until about the mid-1500s, and they go into a fairly quick decline. Uh, and we talk about the Ming and mostly referring to the government itself. Um, the Ming government starts going into decline, especially by the late 1500s, uh, as a result of a you know, basic combination of things that dragged down not just a lot of Chinese governments, but a lot of different governments throughout the world one by one over time. Uh, basically, when you have a government that is in power for a long time, a lot of its leaders who are born into wealth and privilege um, try to you know, keep that for their entire lives, and they, they become distanced, and they become inefficient. They start to enjoy their wealth and luxury a little bit too much rather than focusing on really running the government well or running the economy well. So a lot of government officials who were also large landowners which was the engine of wealth in these ancient societies. Um, they start demanding tax privileges for themselves, cutting the tax rates for themselves. They try to keep as much of their wealth for themselves. They need to take bribes and whatnot. Um, basically seeking personal profit over and instead of government efficiency. 
So the government revenues decline, and when the government faces a real challenge, a, a kind of major catastrophe that will take money to solve, uh, oftentimes they won't have the revenue to really solve the problem. Um, and obviously the people running the government, because they have their own kind of family businesses, they look to use their government power to enhance their own businesses, usually by um, getting the government to give them land or increase amounts of land for their families. And we can identify these kind of corruption problems running through virtually all governments that have ever existed, so uh, this isn't really anything new. But it tends to get worse and worse over time unless the problem's fixed systematically somehow in the bureaucracy. But that's always <laughs> difficult to do because of people passing the laws and enforcing them if they're corrupt themselves. You know, they're the last people that are going to want to make changes, right? They're making a lot of money for themselves. This is the kind of stuff that took down the Roman Empire, took down uh, a lot of the Greek kind of city-states. I mean, this goes way, way back into history. Um, and then you add in the foreign influence that start having impacts in China by the mid-1500s. Uh, the Portuguese making bigger claims economically, making bigger demands. Um, threats of foreign invasion. And there's an economic problem with a lot of the foreign trade. Basically, they start, the foreigners start coming into China, at least in the southern ports they're allowed to enter, and they bring money with them, usually money in the form of gold and silver, because they want to buy Chinese goods and ship them back to Europe where they can sell them for a lot of money. So usually when a European boat arrives, they have a lot of gold and silver on board to buy Chinese goods. Therefore, when they arrive, there's basically an influx of gold and silver into the Chinese market, which causes inflation. So the Chinese government, uh, the leaders who are making money off this trade are reluctant to stop it. And um, like a lot of other governments, they just didn't know a whole lot about economics back then. They didn't know how to stop inflation or how to solve it. Um, economics does not become a studied subject on a systematic basis really until the early 1800s and first in Europe. So this kind of inflation problem, again, was also a problem that helped drag down even the Roman Empire way back when. So this is something that rises every once in a while. And governments, up until fairly recently, are, uh, don't have the, the ideas to fix the problem. Um, they're kind of at a loss for what to do. And then in the mid-1600s, you get a series of poor harvests, even as the Chinese population is growing very rapidly. So more people and less food ends up being a bad combination. You get a lot of peasants that are angry and hungry, and they get violent. Um, and there's also the spread, uh, kind of reemergence of the Black Plague in China that kills off huge amounts of people. And these are you know, social catastrophes. And historically in China, um, a lot of these dynasties have argued that they were chosen by uh, heaven, which is their kind of idea of the deity, the gods, or the creators of everything. Um, that the Chinese government, is, the dynasty is put into place by heaven to run the place. And the deal is, if they run the place well, then the people should be subservient. They should accept the government. If the government starts screwing up, then that is kind of like heaven telling the people that it's time to rise up and replace it. So when you get these large social catastrophes that the government seems unable or unwilling to solve, uh, this is, a lot of Chinese people interpret this as a message from above. It's time to rise up again and replace the government with something new. And the rising up hits. There's another popular revolt um, led by uh, peasant leaders, again. Breaks out 1644 and uh, does great damage to the Ming leadership. But they don't completely overthrow it. Basically, an outside group from Manchuria, which is up here in kind of northern China on the edge of Chinese civilization and in the neighboring groups to the north, the Manchu take basically the Chinese Civil War as an opportunity to invade and conquer China themselves, which is a basic international strategy. It's called divide and conquer. 
if a nation or a people are um, obsessed or interested in fighting amongst themselves, they are easy to conquer from outside because they will not get together usually to fight off the invading force. They will pick sides. They will. And there's often within their own civil war. There's so many mutual hatreds built up that uh, they will often find it difficult to unite their own forces to fight off the foreigners. And that's exactly what happens here. The Manchu invade, they knock out the capital city fairly quickly, and they set up a new dynasty for all of China that they call the Qing Dynasty. Which basically translates as the Pure Dynasty. But that also sets up a problem for the new rulers of China. They are foreigners, and they are obvious foreigners. They speak a different dialect. Um, they dress differently. They have different cultural customs. They're just a very different kind of cultural group, social group, from the main, uh, you know, mainstream Chinese. And when historians have added up the numbers, it appears that the Manchu are only about 2% of the overall Chinese population but they are ruling the government. And that becomes the problem for the Qing dynasty into the long-term future. How do you convince the 98% of Chinese people to accept a government completely dominated by the 2% of the Manchu? Does that make sense? How do you convince them to accept it? And it's always, again, much like Elizabeth and Henry IV in France, it's a tightrope you have to walk between showing that this 2% are powerful and are not going to put up with a lot of complaint, but if you punish the Chinese too much, then that could inspire them to start a revolution. So it's a very fine line that the Manchu have to walk in order to stay in power for the long term. So here's the Qing Dynasty starting in 1644. And uh, with this lecture, we're going to go into the early 1800s. Um, when a series of revolts breaks out. The Qings will actually survive those and go on in, for about another hundred years, but uh, we'll deal with uh, those later developments later, uh, later on the semester. So the Qing dynasty is in place and starts taking legal steps to try to ensure their continued dominance over the economy and the government, but also to you know, not upset the Chinese too much to the point where they will start a revolution. So number one, the kind of ethnic and cultural differences are put into the law code. The Manchus are made legally distinct from the kind of ethnic mainstream Chinese. Uh, the Manchu landowners are given tax privileges where they will pay far less in taxes. Uh, the government gives them large amounts of land. And again, land is the engine, the creator of wealth in these ancient societies. So the Manchu government is basically ensuring that its own society, its own segment of society, will become the economically dominant in China for the long term. So the really wealthy landowners are brought into the government administration, into the executive and kind of legal offices in the government, in, in the Chinese leadership. Uh, the less wealthy Manchu, who don't have huge tracts of land, are given other kinds of government jobs. Basically, they're made into the military leaders, and they fill in the, the kind of officer ranks of the Chinese military. So basically, they set up a, an economic system that if you're an ethnic Manchu, you're basically set. You will get government guarantees of either having a job so you can make enough money to be a fairly prosperous, or you will be given land, or you become actively wealthy. Uh, there, For Manchu businesses and Manchu landowners who tended to go under or go bankrupt, they were given government bailouts. And of course, they're given tax privileges where they're paying far less in taxes than the average Chinese people were. Uh, they also passed laws where um, in order to uh, try to water down the dressing and kind of language differences, they try to at least get the mainstream Chinese to dress in the Manchu style. 
and there is a big difference, especially in the kind of hairstyles between the two societies. So they put into the law codes that even the mainstream Chinese have to start dressing like a Manchu person in order to at least try to mask how few Manchu there are in actual society. If you get everyone dressing the same, that becomes much more difficult to identify um, what the Chinese may think of as the foreigners, the foreign culture. Um, not always very rigidly enforced, because if you enforce this rigidly, uh, you can upset a whole lot of Chinese people to the point where they may start a revolution. So different monarchs, different emperors, and different governments in different times. I mean, remember, this is going on for hundreds of years. Um, some of them will enforce it a little bit less when the political situation seems to be getting closer to a Chinese revolution. They'll kind of pull back and uh, allow people a little bit more freedoms to convince them that this government isn't so bad after all. You know, throw them some crumbs and maybe they'll be happy enough to remain silent. Um, the Manchu also offer religious toleration uh, for the major religions and the major f uh, philosophical movements in China that have been around in China for a long time, specifically Confucianism. Confucianism was a Chinese native philosophy that had been built up a couple thousand years before. So it's been around and was the most popular kind of philosophical movement that was starting to get close to a kind of religious idea where it was you know, very heavily accepted in society. Um, Confucius' philosophy of how to unify society uh, through stratification. You know, you have an upper class, middle class, low class, and then some kind of definitions in between. And uh, each of the lower classes owed its higher up a kind of deference, kind of listen to orders and uh, you know, the, the children of the family listen to the parents, uh, the females in society listen to the men, and of course, it's a very patriarchal society where women just don't have uh, many rights as we would think of them today. Um, as Christianity is introduced by the Portuguese and later the British in 15, 16, 1700s, um, most of the Manchu governments will accept the growth of Christianity. Um, a lot of Chinese start converting to Christianity. And the government tends to allow that to happen until, in certain instances, the Pope tries to meddle a little bit too much in Chinese politics and the government will come through and try to start persecuting some Christians to, um, to break the Pope's dominance. Um, that happens every once in a while in China in these centuries. But for the most part, it is fairly tolerated and Chinese people are allowed to convert. Yeah? Did the Manchu have any a religion? Themselves? They did. They had their own religious ideas, but they didn't want to inflict it so much on the Chinese because, uh, you know, much like Europe in the Reformation, people just do not compromise on religion, right? A lot of them, if they believe that this is what heaven or the gods or whatever want them to do, they will fight for it till the death because they may believe that they're going to be punished in the afterlife for kind of selling out. So, I mean... Religion is one of the major things that people have been unwilling to compromise on and will resist being forced to do something um, throughout human history. Uh, other questions? Nope. Okay. Uh, at first, again, they set up a Manchu dominated government. But over the years, they start bringing increasing amounts of native Chinese into the government. Um, especially by the 1700s. They create what historians have called the diarchy, the, the combination of Manchu and Chinese in the same administration. Um, so they allow Chinese people to get into the bureaucracy, get into the armies and become officers and whatnot. Um, because they realized over time that if you have a completely Manchu-dominated government, that the Chinese are going to realize it at some point and rise up. And uh, again, that's the last thing that the Manchu want to have to deal with. Okay, uh, there are several really important um, Chinese emperors in the Manchu, the Qing era um, that become symbolic of the growing prosperity of, and power of China, especially in the 1600s. Uh, Kang Shi became the emperor of China under the Qing. He was a Manchu himself. 
um, just about 16, 17 years after the Manchu took control of China. And Kang Shi came to the throne at a very early age. He's another one of these uh, kind of kids who's about six years old or so when he gets to the throne. Uh, set up a regency council, yeah, same old deal. Um, and he's going to be on the throne till his death. So he's going to live into, I believe, his early 70s. So he's going to be on the throne for a good six decades or so. So he's going to be around for a while. And he appears to be a very uh, kind of peaceful type of emperor, or at least one of the more peaceful types of dictators you're ever going to get. Um, he did not look to start wars against foreign places. He was not one of these kind of imperialist-driven types of people. So his uh, foreign policy is generally pretty peaceful. He, views, he tended to view war as a waste of money and a great threat to the Manchu government, because if you get involved in war, um, that could cause a lot of problems. If, if you start losing battles and the foreigners start invading, then the Chinese may rise up against uh, the minority government. And you know, War is a risky thing. You don't know what the outcome is ever going to be. So his general foreign policy is fairly peaceful. He has uh, fairly peaceful relations with the neighboring groups around, especially northern and western China. Um, he oversees a period of general economic prosperity in China. Uh, the population is growing, but he's also growing the food supply because Europeans are now introducing uh, kind of hybridized crops, hybridized plants into China that increase the amount of crops they can get per year. They, they have several harvests of the same plant with these hybridized ones. So they get two or three times as much food as they ever had before. So their population is growing very dramatically, but in his era, into the early 1700s, the food supply is keeping up. Um, that won't become a major problem until the late 1700s, when the population continues to boom, but the food supply is kind of peaking and it's not going to grow much anymore. So even by the year 1800, when China gets 300 million people in it, which is a giant number for back then. I mean, the United States today has just over 300 million people. Um, that becomes a giant challenge to the government to actually provide enough food for all those people. Uh, so this is a general era of prosperity, at least by the early 1700s. The economy is growing. The government is responding well. It is building roads and bridges and walls and you know, all the kinds of stuff that government generally does. And uh, the Chinese people are fairly supportive of the government because you know, people in general throughout history, when the economy is doing well, people feel secure in their jobs, they're making money, and they're prosperous. They often just do not look to change their government leaders. And you can trace that throughout U.S. economic history. When the economy is booming, politicians get reelected overwhelmingly. When the economy plummets, that's where you get people voting politicians out. Right? Uh, we've seen that just in the past few years, and you know, we're going to see it in the next few months uh, as the major political debate is going to be economic probably more than anything. Um, Kang Shi was also a very tolerant person, especially of other religions. He appeared to be mostly interested in Confucianism, but he tolerated Christianity also. He allowed it to spread, you know, unless the, the spread of it and the demands of Christians for land or for uh, you know, special privileges in the government or something got to be a little bit too much. Uh, every once in a while, he may kind of throw some people in jail and threaten some Christians in order to you know, keep them under, under control uh, so they don't get you know, out of control, start causing major problems for the government. But he was generally very tolerant and uh, even curious in Christianity. He appears to have studied it even and had contacts with Christian leaders in China. Uh, so his reign is known as really uh, the kind of military and economic height of China in the Qing era. So questions about him at all? Um, well, there's an image of Confucius what the Europeans call Confucius is uh, native Chinese. The Chinese name is Confusa. So they, Europeans bastardized that name, and in the West, it's still you know, this mistake is still made. Just like with uh, even calling Columbus Columbus, his name was Colonius from Italy, and the people he found were not Indians; they were not in India. So these kinds of uh, cultural mistakes and mistaken identities and bastardizations of names, you know, they they get into the language, and they're hard to to kind of cut out after a while. Um, there is an emperor in between 
Kang Shi and this guy, Xiong Long? Uh, this guy really inherits a lot of the prosperity that Kang Shi's government had built up and really invested in in a lot of ways over time. So as he is on the throne from really the mid-1700s going into the late 1700s, the very late 1790s, um, this is where the Chinese economy has really peaked. Um, Chinese art and culture has really peaked, especially in his early years. Uh, this is where Chinese culture has really been exported to a lot of East Asia, a lot of the kind of neighboring areas, and is culturally dominant in East Asia, and it spreads pretty far and wide. But Qianlong is also interested in controlling some of those neighbors, at least economically, if not also militarily. So his government starts investing in not so much good relations, but more power relations. We are wealthier and more powerful than you, so we will either run your economy, or we may, if you complain about that, invade your area and then just run your whole government. So this creates a lot of uh, disputes with neighboring groups, and those disputes get expensive over time. It's hard to buy them off. They're often nationalists and they're often religiously motivated also. So it's hard to just pay them to accept uh, the Qing dominance over their areas. And it's hard to invade and completely repress those populations. So the expense on the military adventures grows and grows through the decades that he's on the throne. And again, we see the, the reemergence of government corruption uh, favoritism toward the rich with tax rates, uh, the drop in government revenue as a result. So when you have an increase in military spending and a fairly dramatic or uh, consistent drop in government revenue, you're going to start getting financial problems. Government is going to start having tr uh, problems balancing its books. And uh, we see that happening in a lot of different countries throughout human history especially when uh, the rich get a, a level of government power where they can avoid taxes. And that stuff has caused revolutions in a lot of different countries. And we'll see it again in uh, places like uh, what eventually becomes the United States and France and you know, on and on and on. Um, so Qianlong has been on the throne for a long time. He dies in 1795. So he's been around for, again, another six decades or so. Um, right in the early 1790s, there's also a crop failure. So the Chinese government is not getting as much food to feed its vastly growing population. And this is where kind of all these problems just hit epidemically right uh, when he dies. And the Chinese people are largely hungry. They understand that there is kind of... Uh, um, tax inequality in the country that the rich are being able to avoid and the you know poor starving people are paying for most of the government and they're not too happy about it so they start a gigantic rebellion, basically a peasant uprising again against the Qing leadership and this uh, permeates right down into the cultural distinctions between Chinese and Manchu and you know the haves and the have-nots. So this is a dedicated rebellion that uh, Qianlong's inheritors, the people who come to the throne and run the government after he is gone, have a very difficult time repressing and defeating. They basically have to take on huge debts and spend huge amounts of money built up a gigantic Chinese army to withstand this rebellion and repress their own people. Eventually they win. It takes about 10 years for the government to win, but the government has spent so much money and so much effort on winning the rebellion that it just completely uh, just destroys the government's ability to be powerful going far into the future for the next hundred years until the next major rebellions break out. So in the 1800s, the Europeans will see the Chinese Qing government as weakened and ripe for the conquest. China has a lot of people, they have a lot of rare goods still, and their military is so weak and their government is so weak that the Europeans will basically just start carving up China for their own benefit in the 1800s. We'll talk about that a lot more in detail um, 
as we get into a beyond the first what couple tests, I think, and we'll get to this in the late 1800s as Europe, we catch up with what's happening in Europe at the same time. Oops, no, damn thing froze. Hmm. So questions about any of that stuff before we move on? Nope. Oh, go ahead. Quick question. Hmm? Um, can, can, can we? Can she? Can she? Uh, Xs like that are often pronounced uh, like the can English she? SH. Yeah. Oh. And Qs are often pronounced as CH. Okay. He wrote between 1661 to 1722. Yep. And then can... There's a gap between 1722 yeah. and this guy in 36. Who wrote between them? Uh, I'd have to look it up again. Uh, someone who didn't last long and was fairly unimportant for the long term. I Can mean, I use that as my credit question? Please? Sure. I mean, I, I have, look, I don't, I don't almost ever keep up with the exact years of stuff. I'm more interested in the long term <laughs> developments, right? So I will almost never ask you even on a test, you know, what, what exact year did this or this happen? And to me, that's irrelevant. I'm more in, interested in the importance of an event and that you can plug it into the, the longer term consequences, right? The longer timeline. So I'm more interested in the kind of conflict of ideas and uh, especially philosophy as, as we'll get into the 1700s. So I'm not usually interested in just dates or exactly you know which person's on the throne at what time. You know, I, that's what encyclopedias are for, right? Um, we don't need to memorize that kind of stuff. So, other questions? Nope. Nope. Okay. Um, China is also going through a lot of types of changes in the same era between, say, about the year, uh, what, 1370 when uh, the Khans were overthrown, going into the early 1800s. And probably the most notable of these changes is just a huge population growth. And uh, China became one of the, the, the very first civilizations that experienced this, what uh, historians call demographic pressure, the pressure of an increased population compared to the amount of resources they have to provide for the population. So in about 1390, the Chinese population was 75 million, which was you know, very large compared to European populations back then, but has vastly increased, it, or increased uh, triple in what, about 400 years or so. So this is a dramatic increase that I think is represented pretty well uh, by the chart here, where you see when the Ming take over and where the Qing are by about the year 1800. This is one of the quickest population rises in all of human history. And it caused a lot of problems. Um, China has a lot of land and they uh, have to have more land to provide enough food for this growing population. Uh, they largely deal with a lot of these problems by uh, their contacts with the Europeans and as they get access to new kinds of crops where they can get more food quicker on a yearly basis. Uh, so they can deal with it at first and into about the early 1700s and then the, the numbers just become too big. The numbers of people just become too large and the government starts having problems. Um, yeah, that's pretty good for that one. Other things that start happening. Uh, China was on the cusp, um, had all the kind of internal developments as early as the 1100s to undergo an industrial revolution. Um, to start building factories and building machines to create uh, production. They don't do it for some reason in the 1100s, and there's a lot of different debates about exactly why the Chinese didn't do it. They seem to have all the kind of social things and natural resources and whatnot at their disposal that the British will have in the mid to late 1700s when the British start undergoing the Industrial Revolution. A lot of the similar things. 
And uh, China still had a lot of that stuff laying around in their culture, in their society, and in their territory in even the 1600s. And it appears that they start taking um, steps, um, not really directed government steps, which is often their big problem. The government doesn't get behind industrialization and give it funding and permission and uh, you know, privileges. Uh, especially the way the British will in the 17 and 1800s. But um, China is such a large area for the time that the large landowners by the 1600s have contact with each other. And the large landowners start making uh, basically trade treaties with different families where they'll send goods from one area to another across China for uh, you know, import and export into certain different cities and whatnot. So they are taking the slow kind of individual steps of unifying their national economy rather than just being one city or another or one region or another. They're starting to make those contacts and bring things together, together into a kind of centralized economy. But they don't do it full scale. Um, largely because the Qing government controls its landowners to a, to a very large extent. The government gave land to certain people and therefore those people who received land tended to follow government orders. Whereas the exact opposite is true in Britain in the 1700s and 1800s, the landowners control the government to the point where the landowners will demand uh, you know, government subsidies and whatnot to invest in factories. Um, and because the government were the highest level peoples in society and the government was not willing to invest so much or give special permission for industrialization to occur, um, Confucianism kicked in and a lot of the kind of lower level landowners owed deference. They were supposed to follow orders from their higher ups. So Confucianism appears to have had a certain amount of impact in the society that convinced the landowners to not complain very much and to uh, you know, not invest too heavily in the kind of machine type of production that will come to dominate the Industrial Revolution. And the uh, Confucian education and the Chinese education system in general um, back then was much more heavily focused on uh, philosophy and art and making beautiful things than it was on the more scientific pursuits of mathematics, chemistry, the things that you will, engineering, the things that you will need in society, at least in the educated class, to build up the machine making process. The inventiveness, the, the, the invention of machines. Who's going to build machines if nobody is really studying engineering very much? And of course, the Europeans invest in that kind of stuff very heavily, especially in the 1700s when uh, national economics becomes a studied uh, academic discipline and the Europeans undergo the scientific revolution in the 1600s. So they start launching much further into scientific developments uh, than almost any other place in the world started in the 1600s, 1700s. And that's one of the main reasons that the Industrial Revolution hits in Europe first. Um, China has also, by that point, evolved a very deep tradition uh, based in the farms, based in agriculture, where the family lives on the farm. Um, families were very large. They weren't just what we call the nuclear family, you know, the, the parents and the children. They often included grandparents and distant cousins, uh, oftentimes people who could not provide for themselves. Who, people have been injured at work or they're just uh, really too old to work to make enough food for themselves to survive. Um, so this kind of family-based agricultural lifestyle was so traditional that a lot of uh, even wealthy landowners were kind of culturally inhibited from investing in other kinds of businesses like building machines and factories. And of course, the taxation policy mostly rewarded the large landowners themselves. So they were much more interested in reinvesting their profits and getting more land than they were in taking a big risk in building uh, what eventually become known as factories. Uh, so that's one of the, those, that's a whole list of reasons why China does not undergo the Industrial Revolution first before the British questions about those at all. Yeah. 
with how like insular China is affect that too? Like they didn't trade with anyone, so they really need to make a lot of stuff to trade. Yeah, historians have made that argument, but other historians and economists have argued um, the Chinese economy, just because of its huge population, was already large enough to have uh, started the process. I mean, the British population in 1800 is far less than 300 million, but they start going into it. Yeah, but they, they have, have access to other European markets, yes. Yeah. Um, but were other European markets as large as just China itself? That's debatable. Yeah, I don't know if it's size though, or like, you know, because it's just the one market. Yeah, or prosperity, yeah. but I mean, government policy has a lot to do with it. The British government invests in factories. Even the U.S. government in the 1790s will give tax benefits to companies that build factories. And the Chinese government uh, doesn't for a long, long, long time until uh, literally the mid-1900s. So they far, fall far behind the curve. Yeah? It seems like the reason, one of the reasons is because of Confucianism taught them that they, ha they should be stable, they should listen to their elders, mm -hmm. they should stay with the status quo and not... Yeah, not question the people above you. Right. Yeah, that has a lot to do with it. Um, and uh, that's one of the arguments uh, amongst economists and sociologists today that a lot of that still is in effect in China. And uh, that the Chinese government today has tried to get its population to focus much more on math and engineering that it has, cr it has a largely destroyed a lot of their kind of cultural creativity. So there's not a whole lot of inventiveness. They can take a machine apart and figure out how it works, um, but there's not a lot of enough cultural openness to get people to ask you know, strategic questions about how to build better systems. And you often get that with dictatorships too. You know, you know, if you're a dictator, you don't want your people asking a whole lot of questions all over the place, because they may start asking questions about politics. Um, why are we so oppressed? That's, that's a major conundrum for a lot of economists argue for China going into the future. You know, will they develop the, the high-tech industries to rival the United States? We'll see. Um, they appear to be trying very much, especially with the solar panel industry. But we'll see what happens in the next few decades. If you know, humans survive in the next few decades, I have my doubts, but we'll see. <laughs> Um, humans are often uh, greedy, impatient, and violent. And when you add nuclear weapons into that mix, things get scary fast. <laughs> um, but that's, you, know, you don't have to agree with me on that. That's not the official statement of Chafee College. That's just my personal opinion. Um, other reason, or other major things that start kind of shifting around, uh, the, co the cultural life in China is very largely based in the family especially if you're living on a farm, your family and the people you have most contact with. And these were patriarchal societies completely, where um, the father of the family literally ruled the family like his own little kingdom. The sons were supposed to take orders, and uh, you know, the women, the, the wives and the daughters were just afterthoughts. They weren't involved in decision making at all. There's almost no rights for women in this society. Um, they're completely subordinate. Uh, women do not have the power to uh, decide who they get married to, decide when they get a divorce or for what reasons. They don't inherit land. Uh, just on and on and on. Women are hugely repressed uh, in Chinese culture at that point. Um, but a lot of this starts getting shaken up with artistic challenges to it, um, especially in music, in art, and most predominantly in literature. Uh, people start writing very controversial books in China that become bestsellers very quickly because controversy sells, right? Hollywood knows this. They put something out there that's kind of wild and offensive to a lot of people. A lot of people will watch it or read it just to find out what it's about, right? So a lot of literature uh, starts creating a lot of symbolic challenges to uh, this very ancient kind of patriarchy. Um, even women start becoming the main characters in stories, which is just a, a revolutionary idea back then. Um, a lot of these stories uh, are inherited from long-term Chinese culture, so a lot of these cultural stories focus on ethics and morality. You know, a person is kind of morally challenged by outside circumstances and they have to make a choice whether to follow a kind of righteous path or to be a you know, greedy bastard kind of a person and destroy others for their own profit. Um, and a lot of these morality tales, just like in Europe, they often 
end with a kind of storybook. You know, they made the right moral choice and were rewarded for it in the end. So, um, but a lot of them also have uh, very challenging little pages and scenes in the stories uh, that challenge the cultural norms, especially sexually. A lot of them, in a few pages, turn to near pornography, which obviously becomes the biggest seller in all society <laughs> for obvious reasons, uh, because it's a sexually repressed culture. Um, the same thing happens in France at the same time. Um, in the 1700s, the most popular, the best-selling books in France were the books that depicted the French queen as a whoremonger, basically. <laughs> um, so these are underground kind of works at first because you know they're government censors. If you're caught with one of these books on you, it is offensive to the government, so you may be punished. So these are underground kinds of things first. But as more and more people read them, they become kind of popularly discussed, and then they can get published as the government realizes you can't repress it completely, or else you'll piss the people off to the point where they may start a revolution. Um, okay. The most famous of these stories, at least by the late 1700s, is The Dream of the Red Chamber, which is basically a soap opera kind of love story. Uh, female characters had the central place in the story. And again, it's a kind of morality tale. So it's a lot of these different pieces. There's also some kind of fairly pornographic kind of scenes in there. And there's a lot of these different pieces that are all represented in the same story. And historians study this stuff. They study culture in this way to get an insight into what the society, what the society was thinking, what it was obsessed about at the time. Because... Um, with this kind of what we today call pop culture, this gives historians a window into what people were thinking about. Because people only go and spend their hard-earned money on a book or painting or something like that when they feel a personal connection to it, right? They're not going to go spend their hard-earned money on something that they don't really care about. There's an emotional connection there. And if there's, an, if there's a connection to enough people where this stuff becomes a bestseller and makes a lot of money, that shows us that a lot of people for some reason connected to some idea in there. And they, they wanted it represented in their life so badly that they're willing to shell out cash to get it. And um, historians study that stuff across all cultures and all times. And that's why literature is such a, a heavily studied kind of subject in art, in art history. We have entire art history and literature classes in colleges because uh, it gives us a window into what that culture, what that society was really obsessed with. Which, you know, historians will do probably if people are around 100 from years from now. You know, they may look back at what the best selling movies of certain years were, or the best selling or highest rated TV shows, which you know, really scares some of us. You know, what are people are going to think about, uh, you know, the fact that we made 20 Saw movies. That they made enough money over and over and over again to justify making another. <laughs> or that there's what, like eight jackass movies now? They're always the best sellers. What are historians going to think a hundred years from now? What's wrong with those people? <laughs> they're going off, even in this, this huge worldwide depression, they're still spending their money on something like that. Or a lot of these kind of fantasy movies that are kind of otherworldly, right? Were people so depressed about their own daily lives that they had to have that two hours of escape to forget about all their problems? <laughs> or then you bring in reality TV and it's... <laughs> <laughs> and people sit around just thinking, man, my life may suck. Man. At least it ain't that bad. <laughs> At least I'm not like that. Sheesh. But um, historians go back into literature of 100 years ago. Right? That's why Ernest Hemingway is still so heavily studied today, and that's why uh, even books depicting what Dracula was supposed to have been like that were written in the late 1800s. Um, those are heavily studied things that historians take very seriously. Um, another image from these things. So art and culture were changing, but very slowly, and they're very aware to still keep the morality ideas and still keep some of the cultural ideas as central pieces of the story, but... The challenge comes in the little bits and pieces, and sometimes the little pieces of language, right? And we can track that over years and decades and whatnot. 
and see how those kinds of challenges grow over time. Like uh, back in the 1960s, uh, what was the, the big controversial book that had a lot of foul language? Catcher in the Rye. If you read that today, you would be bored to tears if you compare it to like a South Park or something like that. <laughs> and you can trace the, that development as it gets more and more kind of vulgar and offensive throughout the past few decades. Okay, last thing I want to talk about is the Europeans arrive. So China is undergoing all these problems demographically, um, possible industrialization that doesn't really get kickstarted very much, cultural debates that are going on within China. So China is not a stagnant, unified kind of place. They have a, basically a foreign occupation, so that's causing political problems, a lot of controversy, a lot of compromise. So China is, like a lot of other countries, just a kind of bubbling cauldron of all these different influences that could potentially cause conflicts into the future. And then the Europeans arrive and become another source of major conflict in China. First the Portuguese start to arrive, and they're given a port that uh, at first is called, uh, I believe it's uh, Macau down here in very southern China, I don't know, away from major populations. But as the Chinese population grows, a huge amount of that demographic growth is not in the central cities, but much further south. So a lot of the younger Chinese people will have exposed contact to European ideas and European religions, especially Christianity. Um, the Chinese leadership, the Qing government especially, tries to keep the foreigners at a distance as much as possible. But like most governments, they are dominated by businessmen, and so there are some Chinese mercantilists who make a lot of money off of buying things from the Europeans and selling them in the Chinese market. And even China creates its own monopolistic companies to run the European trade. And uh, the Portuguese are really the first to do this. Uh, the British went into China with military force and companies their big monopolistic company uh, as they start entering the Chinese trade in the late 1600s is the British East India Company. And the British East India Company is more than just your average company. It has its own army, has its own navy, has its own uh, kind of military bureaucracy. They are basically the foreign policy arm of Britain in India and China and a lot of other places. They are backed by the government and because they are the government sanctioned monopoly they will run the whole Indian trade, the whole Chinese trade. So this company is hugely profitable. Sometimes they overinvest and cause a kind of financial panic in their own stock but you know, that's, that happens at certain times. <coughs> uh, but the British government really uses this company as their foreign policy arm in valuable areas, especially in Asia. And the British really enter China in the late 1600s, um, largely overwhelm the Portuguese, and come to control the China market, at least as far as Europeans are concerned. They become the dominant European force in the Chinese market going into the 1700s. And they will, again, demand increased amounts of power and favor and wealth, and uh, they will eventually demand, uh, let's see if I have another map, there we go. Uh, the big symbolic event of that is the creation of the city of Canton, which eventually becomes uh, Hong Kong, which is a British colony in China until what year? 1999. 1999, they finally turned it over to China. So this is literally British territory in China for hundreds of years. And that is symbolic of the amount of power that Britain was demanding from the native Chinese government. They got their own city. And when the British went into that city, that city was run by British laws. It's what um, internationally we call extraterritoriality which means if you are British and you are in this area of China, you run according to British laws. You don't have to follow Chinese laws. It is like this place is a part of Britain itself. 
Were the Chinese very happy about that? No. Hell no. Because a lot of British people go and live in the city or they have a residence in the city, but they want to trade with the rest of China. So they don't just sit in that city, they travel. They go back and forth. And sometimes they commit crimes against Chinese laws and against Chinese people. So say if a British person goes out and somehow murders a Chinese person, they quickly run back to the city because the British East India Company and uh, whatever British military power is in the area um, will protect them from being arrested. And that's the deal. So this is very offensive to a lot of uh, groups throughout the world. Is that extraterritoriality still in place today? Yeah. Absolutely it is. And the United States is one of the bigger ones in the world that's using it. Um, for instance, if uh, an American company, um, say oil company or oil refinery or something, is bombed in Saudi Arabia, who does the investigation? The American FBI. And a lot of Saudi people are not very happy about that. And we have a lot of instances of American military personnel going into these foreign areas and uh, committing crimes and then running back to their base. And uh, they may get put up for a court martial or something. And one was just uh, acquitted, uh, what, last week or so. It happens pretty consistently. It tends to piss off a, a lot of other peoples throughout the world. Um, but that is generally extraterritoriality, and it's, it's very powerful. Um, politically, it's seen as a great slap in the face to a lot of people in the world. And uh, there's a controversy, I think, about a was it last spring, um, where the United States wants to keep a, mili a U.S. military base in, I believe it's Ecuador. And the uh, Ecuadorian president said, no, I'm not interested in that. It's, you know, why would we want to have American soldiers in our country? And it doesn't really help us at all. Um, and the U.S. government and a lot of U.S. news outlets were saying, you should allow us to do this. And the Ecuadorian president said, well, I'll make you a deal. I'll allow an American military base here in Ecuador if you give us an Ecuadorian military base in Miami. <laughs> what did the American government say to that? No. Hell no, that doesn't make any sense for us. And, you know, the American population that are aware of this are like angry at the Ecuadorian president for even proposing it. Seems like a fair deal, logically. But once you get patriotism involved, things get wacky. <laughs> but uh, extraterritoriality has been around for a long time, and it's still around today. Uh, so the British were just one that started this, but this city of Kenton becomes you know, very symbolic of this and a, a huge uh, sore kind of thorn in the side of a lot of Chinese people. Um, and obviously when uh, Christian missionaries set up their... Uh, infrastructure in Canton, they try to go off into China and convert more and more Chinese people to Christianity. Um, that sometimes will be met with uh, Qing repression, government repression against uh, even Chinese people who have converted if you know the, the Christian leaders start demanding too much, uh, the government will go in and kind of try to destroy them, uh, persecute them for a couple years just to make sure that they can be kept under wraps. Um, but if that works. Going into the future, uh, the British become hugely emboldened. They make more and more and more and more demands. Um, eventually, by the late 1700s, uh, they send an official government envoy, an official representative of the British throne. This guy's name is McCartney. He goes to China to get a treaty that would give the British a whole series of things that uh, the Chinese government really resisted. Why? Because this is just a year or two before that giant White Lotus Rebellion breaks out. The British government knows that the Chinese are having problems, they're having problems with their own people, so they view this as a good opportunity. And when the Qing leaders reject McCartney's proposals and largely refuse to negotiate on the basis of those proposals, uh, McCartney goes back to Britain and tells the British government, uh, Chinese people are absolutely insane, there's no dealing with them, you know, we're going to have to uh, possibly do something violent to them to force them to accept what we want. 
So that's a major source of debate and international problems for the Chinese government going into the future. So questions about any of that stuff? Yeah. Um, why did um, Canton go back to China in 1999? Uh, it, after World War II, Britain started giving up a lot of pieces of its worldwide empire that we've already talked about, especially India. Um, a lot of other places. So it had uh, really couldn't afford, after the destruction of World War II, to keep running that empire. So it gave up on a lot of them, but tried to hold uh, a few little pieces every, every now and then. Um, the Chinese government was rising in power in the 1970s, late 70s and 80s, and negotiated a treaty with Britain. And, it was a hard negotiation, and eventually the British were convinced that it wasn't worth trying to argue against China to keep. So they signed a treaty. And uh, they signed it well in advance. I think it was like 10 years before the actual turnover or something like that. So it was known that this was going to happen well in advance. But it was still a very symbolic thing, especially for the Chinese government to claim that they've you know, taken back that one of those last pieces of land from the European intrusion. Um, Chinese government is still interested in taking more land, obviously, especially Taiwan, which is directly supported and defended by the U.S. government and has been since the 1950s. Um, so that's an ongoing kind of controversy. But you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, other questions? Okay. That's about it for tonight. Um, make sure I get your homework. If you need to still take the map, 